Nigeria has announced 594 new cases of COVID-19, bringing the total number of infections in the country to 22,614. The Nigeria Center for Disease Control, NCDC, announced this on Thursday to its official Twitter handle. The NCDC said that the 594 new confirmed cases were from 22 states with seven deaths as of Thursday. And 36 fully recovered COVID-19 patients have been discharged by the Lagos State Government on Thursday. This is according to a tweet on the Lagos State Ministry of Health official handle, which explained that the recovered patients were discharged after testing negative for the virus. While giving a breakdown of the recovered patients, the Ministry of Health said 11 of the patients are females, while 25 are males. We're now joined by Dr. Irwe Akase, infectious disease consultant physician from LUT. Thank you very much for joining us. Morning. Thank you for having me here. All right. Uh, the numbers are growing by the day. Should we resort to the reality of living with this virus at this point? Yeah, I mean, it will be, it will seem to be the rational thing to do. Um, what, what the evidence shows at the moment is that um, uh, until a, vi a vaccine comes out, the number of new cases are just going to keep increasing. Um, so in truth, even in hospitals, most people are waking up to realization that we can't keep isolating. It's not possible to isolate all the people with COVID-19 anymore. Uh, it's likely that we're going to start having them in clinics, in general wards, and in surgeries and all of that. So. I, I think, yeah, I agree. We'll have to start thinking that we'll probably leave this thing for a while. The World Health Organization has predicted that the virus would be with us for uh, between 12 to 18 months. What new strategies should be, uh, we be exploring in terms of managing the COVID-19? Okay, so, um, well, there are also the strategies have to be always in divided into what you can do in the public health perspective and what you can do in terms of individual case management. As much as individual case management uh, is entailed, um, it simply means developing new strategies to improve survival of those that do come into hospital. The limit of these means that the limitation with this kind of approach would mean that there are going to be new cases just multiplying within the community and those who are vulnerable you know, may not do so well. So this is where you need to combine that with the public health approach. And this, and one of the most crucial, in addition to wearing people wearing face masks, which is so crucial at this moment in time, because when people wear face masks, they protect one another from developing infections and so therefore sort of prevent the cough from rising too rapidly at the point in time. This is one. But I think also most important, and I don't know how that, a lot of thought needs to go into this in our setting, is how we can protect the vulnerable population and the vulnerable population here, of course, we know the elderly people more than 65 years, those who have comorbidities like cancers, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and all of that. This, this group of people do not do so well when they get infected with COVID-19. So we have to find ways of protecting them. This probably will mean that, you know, keeping them away from uh, high, high population areas, giving them, making sure those ones, especially work from home, even though our community economies, you know, are opening up workplaces are resuming, it has become very important for groups like that to, you know, work from home. You need to protect groups like that. Otherwise, if they get infected, outcome usually, uh, you know, it's not so good in most of them. So in addition to wearing face masks, hand hygiene, um, social distancing and all of that, complying with uh, COVID-19 practices, COVID-19 compliant practice in the workplace, protecting the elderly is quite crucial because when they get infected, I mean, it's, it's a scramble. It's a scramble, really, and uh, it boils down to uh, this where now the new developments in science, in medical practice, comes to play. So it these practices does. have to put together. Yeah. All right, let's uh, see if we can um, address other issues. Um, let's look at um, managing COVID-19 patients, for instance. As one in charge of an isolation center, what is it like managing these patients? Well, the, as you can imagine, um, you know, at the beginning we had, you know, uh, we were admitting all patients. And so that, that obviously came with a lot of pressure. Um, some who were not so ill to, to those who were quite ill. Now uh, that shifted a little bit. We don't admit everyone. We only admit those who are very sick. 
And we have those who are, and so you can imagine, elderly people. And now the people who are admitting don't just have only COVID. They also have other comorbidities, whether it is poorly controlled diabetes, poorly controlled hypertension, and all of that. So it therefore means that uh, in addition to treating the COVID, you also have to make sure that whatever underlying condition they had is taken care of. This obviously can be quite challenging. For some, the, some would need dialysis, kidney, that's kidney, kidney support, while they recover. It's providing that can be a challenge because not all dialysis centers can dialyze COVID patients or are willing to dialyze COVID patients. Some will need ICU care. We don't have so many of those around. We're limited in terms of capacity to do that. Some will require you know, psychological support. Some may require even surgical. So care for COVID patients goes beyond just treating COVID. It involves all of these specialties. And uh, I think one of the challenges we're having at the moment is getting to develop or gather together a multidisciplinary team that is able to provide for the various medical needs. So that obviously, you know, has been quite a challenge in terms of providing right. optimum care. Most of the time when people die, people that die from COVID, they do so because of either the complications or the comorbidities or the organ failures that all of this, you know, uh, in the state. So help us, help us understand what happens to those who succumb to COVID-19. The argument uh, from uh, most is that no one sees that part. And as such, uh, this continues to feel doubt and mistrust and skepticism about the, uh, the fact that, um, I mean, that the belief that COVID-19 is a scam. Yeah, um, this is a this is a, a thought pattern I've encountered a number of times. I mean, just yesterday we had to, um, you know, face something similar from a patient that you know did that. Um, it's rather unfortunate because even for now, if you look at the statistics for COVID nineteen, at the beginning, in the, at the beginning when people get COVID nineteen in the first week or there about of infection, about ninety eight percent of them will sh had show mild symptoms or nothing at all. But this can change well quite rapidly. By the end of the second week, you discover that that same group of people, 98% of who were mild or no symptoms at all, it shifts. You now find that 80% have mild and up more than 20% are not having severe disease. So it can shift suddenly. So, and unfortunately, by the time people now face the realization that, oh, you know what, this is real, and the sitting hurts most times for those who are infected, it may, that realization may come you know, a little bit too late. For the general population, and I think, and this is something I've said over and over again, that it probably has, reflects, one, the work we need to do to engage the public more about making them see the face. I mean, I've had people say we should show them faces of people who are in, who are in COVID-19 worlds. Of course, that's not, that's, not realized, that's not realistic. But it also means that um, the distrust the population, the Nigerian population has to government and authority and officials, so much so that they're quoting figures, and everybody say, ah, this is not true, it's a scam. It's rather unfortunate. I think right. a lot of work needs to be done in that aspect of All engaging right, the doctor. public and, you know, making them see what's really going on. Because we are indeed sitting on a big problem. Dr. Kese, thank you very much for the insights you brought to the conversation. It's a pleasure. Thank you.